That was really wonderful. And I have so many questions to ask you. Uh, first of all, I want to get back to something Melissa said at the, um, in her opening remarks about how this is a new music series at the Exploratorium and Museum of Science. And I wonder if, in your experience, there are people who are knowledgeable about science and there are people who are knowledgeable about arts, but that you're rare in your knowledge of both at the same time. Um, well, I, I don't really feel very knowledgeable about, about either of them, to be honest. I, <laughs> I feel like I'm a bit of a sort of, uh, not a philistine, but you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just very interested in all sorts of things. And, um, and, and so, and, and I haven't got very good uh, discipline to really push something through to total excellence. So I tend to sort of um, involve myself in lots of things that interest me, which means I'm interested and in do a lot of different things without being a specialist, if you see what I mean. So, and, and to me, um, I mean, I was pushed into science as a kid because I was told I was tone deaf and couldn't paint or draw, so I wasn't allowed to do anything artistic. And uh, it was only like, when um, punk rock started in 1977 that I met people that said, you can, you can play music, you know, it's easy. You just play one chord for half an hour, it's fine. <laughs> and, and then, <coughs> so I, you know, I got into playing music and one thing led to another. And, but I had to teach myself music f from a kind of mathematical basis because uh, I suppose I'm a sort of person that, um, I, I, I need systems to operate, so I make systems and I understand things <coughs> through systems and then gradually my facilities catch up with them, so I'm not totally tone deaf anymore, I've sort of learned to hear a bit. But, um, so I'm very interested in science, um, but I, don't, I haven't got the discipline or, or will to be accountable in the way a scientist has to be. Um, <coughs> But I like to know how things work, you know, like going back to systems. So, and things work, that goes from taking apart clocks and not being able to put them together as a child to, you know, trying to understand what the hell time is or, you know, how far is the end of the universe, whatever. So all these things I sort of, obs I, I'm probably a bit, I don't know, I might have a condition or something, I don't know, but I just have, to, I'm obsessive about these things. And so I have to find out, but I sort of find out um, from a more an artistic point of view. I thought it was interesting that you included instruments among the music making um, elements in, in this work, but that they were only some of the possibilities, that there was a piano and music boxes and various sort of traditional drum music making uh, instruments, but that they were just in the midst of all these other ways to make music. Yeah, well, well, really, the, I mean, the, the thing about those films is they're, um, you know, they started, like I said, from um, the, the accident of not having a tape recorder. Uh, <clears throat> and then I got interested in, well, what sounds can I film? And so at certain points, you know, like a nice creaking door, it's always very seductive and that's easy to film, but things like, um, you know, some other things are a bit more contrived. For example, a piano note. Um, and we all know what a piano note sounds like, so in a way it's not so interesting. I'm kind of, but then when you put it in that context, I think it works, but I'm more interested, I suppose, in the notion of uh, an idea that everything has a kind of sonic soul. And uh, sometimes you have to break things to find it or something. You know, like a fence, it sits there silently, but if you run a, or, or a spoke of a bicycle wheel, you know, it, it's not really a noisy thing, it doesn't, but it has a beautiful sound, but you have to activate it. So I kind of like looking for those things. And then when you get the sound from, when you get the sound, how, what do you do then? How do you process it? Well, I, <coughs> in this context, I've got these little films. You know what what we saw then. But the but um, sonically, I mean, what do you do to the sound? Oh, nothing. 
But you say, for instance, the piano sound, it's not the normal. Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. I meant, um, no, I mean the, the, the film of the piano. I mean, it's contrived in the sense that um, I've thought, oh, it would be nice to have a film of a piano note because of the way I could use it in my system. Does that make sense? I think so, yes. Yeah, whereas it doesn't feel contrived, so contrived to take a film of a, a fridge that's making a weird sound because the fridge is not something one would usually consider <laughs> in that sense. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, how has it been working with the Meyer Constellation system? Um, well, it's, uh, I don't feel I've even scratched the surface, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, it's a m most fantastic sounding sound system. And it's not what I expected. When, when I was thinking about this place for the last few years, <coughs> in fact, it's very odd because I thought I was coming in October. It was a terrible accident almost because of the way Americans write dates. I thought, <laughs> <coughs> I, thought I was coming on the 4th of October, <laughs> not the 10th of April. <laughs> so I haven't had, I've lost six months of preparation. <laughs> but um, it's fortunate I could make it, really. But anyway, no, so I imagine this space being sort of like a domed, sort of like a planetarium for some reason. Mm. Um, and though I'd seen all the diagrams of the speakers, um, which obviously... Um, show that it's the most sort of non-linear kind of speaker system you can imagine. For example, you know, there's all these speakers around there, like, and then they're not, then there's different types all over the place, and like, behind those curtains, there's lots of little speakers, I mean. So I'd kind of imagined it as a uniform constellation of speakers, so that if you move a sound sort of in any direction, the sound stays the same but it doesn't. Because say, if you run a sound along the back there, it's gonna sound very different than if you run it along that wall there. So <coughs> that was a bit confounding. And uh, so, you know, we had to sort of work around that. Um, so really, I don't understand it at all. <laughs> <coughs> but you've been working with it for a couple of days. Yeah, and all I've learned is that I really don't understand it and I need a lot more time to get to grips with it. But it sounds beautiful. Well, I hope really you can beautiful. come back October 4th, then. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's in my diary. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about, about video and music together, because as, as a pianist, I've worked with video, and I remember my father coming to one of my concerts and saying, you know, we're so trained to listen to music in the background as soon as we see a visual image that in television or movies or whatever, the music is there as a, in the background as a soundtrack. And you have done the sort of flip side of that. Um, but still, the, the, there's something so compelling about image. And I'm interested in that you use this sort of triptych of three images on the screen. Um, but even you know, after a while, people started to sort of noisily eat popcorn around me as they would at a movie, um, but wouldn't at a concert. So I thought that was, that was interesting. But what, people were eating popcorn here? Mm -hmm. Great. Noisily. <laughs> I should have recorded them. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, the crinkle, crinkle, crinkle. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, do you not think that's true? Does the, does the visual not overpower the music? Uh, well, no, it's an interesting thing because, you know, my sort of conceit, I suppose, about it is that I'm improvising a sound piece mm. from these films of sounds. But actually, it becomes very hard not to also be guided by the images and the juxtaposition of the images. So um, I, wouldn't, I, I don't know if the images overpower the sound, but uh, it doesn't matter if they do, because I'm, you know, all I, I'm, I'm not trying to not make a film. I'm trying to make something, but it's just made from sort of inverting the usual 
primacy of the visual over the sonic. Yeah. Why are some of the pitches different, like the, tea, the two teapots together, and then they're at different pitches? Because I can speed up and slow down the films, yeah. which gives me the remarkable ability to make, you know, a, a chord out of one little film and so on. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, and that transforms, and you can turn them around and loop them and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. It was... Um, it was playing when people walked in, and I, I, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts about beginnings and endings, and that something's already begun. I mean, we, we usually, when we listen to a piece of music, we need a beginning, middle, and end. And of course, in your long player, the thousand year long piece of music, uh, we can never experience the beginning and the end. The beginning was December 31st, 1999, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the end is exactly the same as the beginning, because <coughs> I ran out of ideas. <laughs> uh, no, because it's like it's composed in a circular form, so in a sense, it has no end and beginning. It, it once it started, you know, it it really it's it's not really a thousand year long piece of music. It's more like an everlasting piece that repeats every thousand years. So. And because it's a loop, um, I in a sense, there's no beginning or end. And it's uh, it's live performance and computer. Is that right? Um, well, it's um, it can be performed live. It can be performed by a computer, and and it could be performed by machines or any conceivable thing you could think of to perform it, which is important from the point of view of uh, that it can carry on in any, you know, situation, technologically, etc. Um, <coughs> but from a practical point of view at the minute, it's being performed by a computer, but from time to time, we do live performances. Wow. So in 2010, um, Long Now brought us over very generously to put on a concert in the Yerba Buena Center. Oh. And Wayne Grimm played in and that yeah, concert. That's said. how I met Wayne, and that's why I'm now here. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he said it was a really exhilarating experience. I mean, it, it just, uh, to, to perform that piece must be um, so completely different from playing a sort of sonata that has a, you know, beginning and, and uh, recapitulation development section. Yeah, it's like being just part of something much longer. Than, than <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it is. It's very different, and it's very... Um, it's quite demanding to play it as well. Yeah. It takes a lot of concentration, but it's also there's something really wonderful about the... You know, it needs... You know, it, by, well, like any ensemble of music, you need all the other people, but... It, 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 for me, it feels a, a lot more um, like that. That suddenly, that really is long player. I mean, the computer version feels quite provisional to me. When you've actually got people playing it, it's sort of really alive. Mm. Uh, you, I, I saw a couple of your scores in the green room um, before we came on tonight, and. Um, I think there's one up maybe at the Exploratorium website or somewhere there's, there's um, some of your scores. And tell us about how you, how you prepare a score and your own kind of notation and when performers are playing the long player, they're not using one of these, one of these kinds of scores, are they? Um, well, uh, well, no, when, they are, when they're playing long player, they are following a score. And and the, what the score is is it's a very simple graphic score, which is based on long player um, is made out of a system operating on um, a, sh a short piece of source material music. So if you imagine, and that's made of uh, singing bowls and and a lot of silence. So if you imagine taking that um, source music and you looking at it on a computer, it's waveform on a computer. So you know, a waveform of a piece of music on a computer, it's a, it's a, it's a graph of 
of time of how volume varies with time yeah so um that that's that became the basis of the score a graphic score so it's like making literally drawing out the waveforms and putting the instruments that they represent next to them and then you you play it according to that so <coughs> and then having a sort of timeline and saying okay so in that minute it, the volume varies like that yeah. so it's a very simple graphic score and what about the scores you use in in your pieces what do they consist of? Uh, well, it depends on the piece. So, like what I just did, the score consists of um, lots of uh, sort of notes of names of the different films and pitches uh, and where each one might go next. And then <coughs> I get terribly confused because I think, oh, no, it would be better to put that one in there. So I do an arrow to somewhere else and then I've got six pages and... I go from page one to page three, back to page two to page, like, you know, so it becomes, it starts to look very complicated, but really it's just the result of confusion. Can't you just renumber <coughs> the pages? No. Uh, not really, because sometimes you have to go back twice from different uh, points. Yeah. You'd have to, I, I did actually buy some scissors and glue. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to do some old fashioned cutting and pasting, but I ran out of time. <laughs> Some of us are very fond of the strain of sort of nutty composers who have followed their own path, like Dane Rudyar, who equated dissonance with a kind of cosmic spirituality, and Conlon Nancaro, who had the player piano as his instrument, Ellen Fullman, who lives here as a long string instrument stretched across a room. Do you, do you feel like you're part of that tradition? Um, I'd, I'd never considered it. I mean... It's very illustrious company <laughs> to be to be. Harry in. Parch. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean they're all brilliant. I mean, uh, I don't think it's for me to say. Mm. If someone wants to consider me like that, then I, I'll I'll humbly take it upon me. But I guess I'm thinking of people who think of music just. I, I hate the term outside the box, but who, you know, we all think of of music in a particular way, but music is something completely different to these people and to you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, well, we're living in a time when it's, you know, that people have really broken down the boundaries about, you know, now anything can be accepted as music, you know, <coughs> starting with Cage and people, I guess. Um, and so for someone who's, you know, not terribly musical, um, it's a very good time to, to be alive and to have this sort of amazing <laughs> technology of a computer. So, I mean, I can sort of make music of instruments I can't really play. Like, I made some harp music recently, mm -hmm. and I played the harp, but it was kind of rubbish, and then I put it all together, and it, I found it really beautiful to listen to, but I couldn't play it. So, so you know, we have, it's a very fortunate time to be alive in, in that sense. Is John Cage an inspiration to you? Um, yeah, I like a lot of his music, and um, yeah, no, he's f yeah, he's a very fascinating thinker and and man. Yeah. Let's talk about the the piece we'll hear next. Star Starfield is that right? Yeah, Starfield. Um, when when uh, between two thousand and three and two thousand and five, I worked in Oxford Astrophysics Department as an artist in residence, and. Um, while I was there, I kind of was nosing around and I sort of discovered this discipline called helioseismology, which someone then told me, yeah, it's, it's like, um, you know, we're studying the pulsations of stars. And I didn't know stars pulsed. I thought they just sort of sat in the sky like kind of blobs, but they're more like, a lot of them are like jellies and they're sort of contracting and expanding. And, and the cosmologists, astronomers, they, they use the, um, these pulsations, which they detect through variations in light, as um, to, to um, understand the inner structure 
the, the sort of seismological structure of, of uh, the sun and then stars. So there's this thing, uh, discipline, um, astro seismology for all other stars. <coughs> and when, when I was there, the only one you could uh, find any sort of um, sonifications of was our sun. Um, but I kind of loved this idea that, you know, all stars are kind of like ringing and their own, they all have their own resonance. They're all ringing like, uh, like a bell. And, uh, and I, I wanted to try and make a very simple installation using such sounds. And that's a kind of weird fiction that I'll talk about a bit, but, um, called Starfield. And anyway, I couldn't do it because uh, I couldn't find any other kind of sounds. Uh, when Wayne sent me uh, a diagram of this sound system, which is called the constellation, um, and the diagram looks just like a weird star map, um, I thought, oh, well, being literal-minded sometimes, uh, I'll why don't I try and do Starfield on the constellation? Uh, and I suppose I imagined that like every speaker could have a different sound coming out, but obviously it, it can't. Um, so I, I started doing more research, and now, a few years later, uh, there's a lot of stars you can find sonifications for. And uh, also, so I, I grabbed a lot from the internet and then I made some of my own, um, and I'm going to use them to uh, play some music. But I also want to briefly talk about them first, because I think it's interesting to know what you're listening to. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Do you want to talk about them now? Well, I need to talk about them with my... Um, computer. Oh, okay. Because, uh, not because I'm insecure without yeah. my computer, but <laughs> because I, then I can play the, yeah. them. Yeah. Let me ask you just one more question. Uh, earlier tonight, when we first met um, backstage, you were gathering data. Maybe that's something you're going to talk about, but I wonder if when you, when you do this piece, is it, is it important to have the newest, have the latest data from the stars? Uh, no, well, what I was gathering was um, just information about the different stars that I have sounds for. Um, I wasn't gathering any new um, sounds. But I, yeah, I mean, I, I did actually find some sounds that I hadn't found, but I can't use them today. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I've got plenty enough. Uh, okay, well. Okay, uh, so I, I guess we have to um, carry that table over here with my computer. Uh, Not you. You don't have to, Sarah. Don't worry. Okay, I'd be glad w to. Wayne and, Wayne and I have to, to do okay. it. Okay. Well, thank so you. So bear with us. Thank yes. you, Sarah. Lovely thank you. to speak to you. Thank you.